Hello and welcome to our in-session talk, Publishing the Self. We have um, over 200 uh, guests from 35 countries joining us today. Before I introduce you to our esteemed speakers, Gary, Richard and Tony, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping uh, items. Today's webinar is being recorded. We shall share the recording on our event page next week. Please use the chat button if you have any technical difficulties uh, regarding the webinar. We also invite you to submit your questions by using the Q&A button. You can upvote the questions if you like. And any remaining unanswered questions, we're going to uh, endeavor to answer them after the, um, after the session. Please, without further ado, join me in welcoming our speakers. I'm going to hand you over to Richard, who is going to start today's conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And welcome, everyone. Hello. Um, it's my pleasure today to be chairing today's in-session discussion on publishing the self. Um, my name is Richard Nash. I am a tutor at the Royal College of Art. I'm also a practicing designer and artist. Joining me today for this conversation are Tony Brook. Hello. And Gary Clough. Hello. Thank you. Um, so I'm delighted to welcome you all to this discussion on the subject of the progression portfolio and parallels to forms of publishing, which is very much going to be the centre of the conversation that we have today. Um, the discussion will last for about 45 minutes um, and will be structured into three parts. So the first part, in the first instance, Tony, Gary and I would like to share an aspect of our practice to really just initiate a conversation and draw some of these parallels into, into the conversation. Next, what we will then do is go into a round robin style of Q&A so we can expand on some of the points in our initial, uh, our initial talks. And finally, we'd like to invite you to participate in this conversation, to ask questions, share your own experiences. So to start this conversation, the discussion, I'd first like to invite Tony to talk through his experience, his insights um, and perspective working with SPIN and Unit Editions. Thank Over to you, Tony. Thank you very much. I'll just share my screen. So can we all see that? Yes, yeah. we do. Yeah, great. Okay. So I'm going to try and uh, give you uh, a brief overview of, um, of Spin and Unit Editions. So uh, Spin started in... 1992, so over the last 20 years, we've been involved in all kinds of uh, disciplines, design disciplines mainly, um, although recently we've uh, become more interested in, or we've started including more artistic kind of in, endeavors into our uh, work. This is a, just a brief overview of the kind of people that we created visual identities for. So you can see there's a real range of different types of companies there. Um, as I said, we, we're starting to see ourselves more as, as artists and designers now. Um, this is uh, basically an overview of, our, of both outputs, really. Okay, 
So that gives you a, a brief overview of the kind of work that we make. Um, we've recently started investigating more personal work, as I said, more artwork. Um, and this is, these are some sketches of, from a project which we've been developing, which has been a kind of a response to COVID in some ways, um, in saying hello to the world and the outside world again, and to uh, minor conservative politicians, bizarrely, although that might take a little bit of explanation. So with the, well, the, I, actually, I might as well say something about this. The, the idea, initially the idea was that hi was always a peaceful thing to say, but then we realized, of course, that it depends on who's saying it to you. Um, so hopefully I'll get to talk a little bit about this work later as part of our portfolio. And about unit editions, basically we, we did, um, we were commissioned to do a book some, must be 15 years ago now, by a commercial publisher. And we were appalled by all the comprom compromises that we had to make uh, in, in designing a book for a commercial publisher in terms of not only the uh, design of it, but also the mechanics of it, the, the kind of paper that we were allowed to choose, the, what they, the compromises that they were willing to make for the sales force. Um, it was just, it wasn't a pleasant experience in any way, shape or form. And so based on, on the back of that, we started unit editions. I started with um, Adrian Shaughness and my partner, Patricia Finnegan. And the, the idea really was to make books that not only were hopefully beautiful, but also showed, um, like the interesting stories that designers had to tell or explore the interesting stories that designers had to tell and to dig much deeper. So there were, at the time, there were a lot of um, books that were very, skip, very much skims, lightweight kind of books, like your favorite hundred um, kind of uh, business cards or something like that. And we wanted to go into something much deeper than that. So we started exploring our subject and want, trying to tell stories about, about design that weren't necessarily being told. And we've, we've I mean, our, the, the, the book company is almost entirely based on sales online. So we're, we basically fulfill our own, our, our orders and, you know, we're, we're outside of, um, Amazon or anything like that. We're an independent publisher. And the subjects that we that we kind of follow up on tend to be people that have either either individuals that have got a, an interesting story to tell or that have some really compelling need for a book that wouldn't ordinar ordinarily be made. Um, that's not necessarily the case with Paul Cher. But yeah, hopefully I'll say within my five minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. That was um, a really insightful presentation. I think the showreel in itself was fantastic to see and it, in some ways has its own way of kind of impacting this conversation. And certainly we'll pick up in the Q&A section afterwards the idea and importance of self-initiating, self-directed projects. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Gary, uh, if I could invite you to present next. <clears throat> of course, Richard. Yes, thank you. So let me just uh, share my screen. Always good to go backwards. So, yeah, um, very different presentation. Um, I'm really going for, I suppose, the definition of a portfolio, which is basically some loose sleeves in well, interesting noise i don't think it's my cue <laughs> so um so this notion of a collection of loose leaves but for me a sketchbook is very much this notion of how not the way you publish self but how you engage with self in this terms of a platform and i suppose there is an aspect of publishing daily 
or publishing incrementally, which is a very important part of my practice. I've been working with sketchbooks for all of my career. And I think this sense of a book, a place where anything can happen and where that sort of discourse between the subject and the viewer and the audience sort of happens instantaneously. Not necessarily maybe the traditional notion of a sketchbook being a place where you collect something and then later you expand upon it or it becomes a starting point for a body of work. Both happen within my practice, but fundamentally for me, I see the sketchbook as a, a sort of a, a world, a place, a place to publish, a place to actually note, to note down, to confound actually and confuse. And I use a lot of varying references throughout the sketchbook. I do use the sketchbook in a place where I travel, a lot of my practice, I've been very fortunate, I've moved around the world in terms of education, as well as also within um, craft based. Uh, as I've, you know, I've worked in the building industry, I've worked in different countries, different societies, and it's been really exciting to always have this thing with you. And I think, for me, when you look at a drawing like this, they are these conglomerations or these aggregates of moments in time. And they often I will work into a page over a period of time. So again, this sense is the page is not dead. It's a live document. And I think in terms of how we position what we're discussing today, for me, the sketchbook is a really fantastic vehicle to think about the portfolio, a place where self happens. Self is actually tied down for moments, but it's still a fluid thing that can be returned to and left at any particular point. This is from the out, you know, looking out the taxi window in Guangzhou um, with various notes to sell. This is a restaurant in um, Hangzhou, actually, I believe, uh, and trying to work out not just for what was dinner, but on the, on the page next to it, what I was doing in the gallery next door. So the sketchbook is, is also, in terms of a portfolio, it's not just about notating what you see or what you're trying to deal with. It's also a place where you analyze your practice and you actually analog what's going on. And I, I really love the way that the sketchbook interfaces between these different activities, or it becomes a place to literally learn language or to engage with language. <clears throat> In terms of the fact that it has this accessibility, it can be manipulated, you can add things to it, you can remove things, you can move things around within the sketchbook. I think the other thing is that about this revisiting, and I think quite often with portfolios, one of the things that I think the sketchbook will allow you to do within a portfolio is to show journey and also show a very personal journey, something that can sometimes be lost in a portfolio. A lot of these are very much related to work that I take out of the sketchbook. I work in, with embroidery, I work with drawing, and I work with drawing as an actual art form as such, not just a, a sketchbook, also within the sense of sculpture. And I think I often will use grids. And I think, again, in terms of our discussions, I think this notion of gridding or pre-gridding and then having to work with a sketchbook almost like a found object or a space in itself. They are fundamentally virtual studios. That's how I've always refer, referred to my sketchbook. And again, this ability to sort of see things next to each other. And often I'll cut through pages and have things coming back and revisit or blank things out as I go forward. And then finally, this is just an example of two works, which I thought were relevant today <coughs> in terms of um, that notion of how you place things within a space. And these are predetermined spaces and the objects being drawn to fit into those spaces. And I think when you're producing a portfolio, often you're compromised by this thing. I'm trying to fit everything in. And I think this is an example in a way of what can go wrong with a portfolio. <laughs> Maybe there's too much crammed in. Or if it is crammed in, there's a way of pulling it back out and getting the viewer and audience to re-engage with it. And I think fundamentally what I would end on is just that for me, the sketchbook is a place where you are publishing, as I said, 
on a daily basis. And I think it's that act of putting things out there. And currently, my current research is actually working with other artists and actually sharing sketchbook practice and actually producing collaborative sketchbooks, which is a really exciting project that I'm just starting to get involved in and starting to talk about what that space is within the sketchbook and how it actually connects more broadly to how work is presented or publicised and not the sense of a book and a very personal space and maybe a shared space. So thank you. I hope that's me a bit of an insight and I look forward to the discussions that will come next. So thank you, Richard. Thank you, Gary. Um, really interesting to obviously hear the parallels between sketchbook because not only intrinsic to your practice, but that parallel to the portfolio itself. And by title, we call this session Publishing the Self. And maybe the idea of the sketchbook is the initiating point of that conversation. Um, and really interesting. I hope that my presentation in some respects maybe also picks up on some of those similar concerns about the idea of maybe the book being more like a methodology or a tool to think with which is something that I, I will be talking to. Um, so thank you, thank you very much Gary. Um, if you'd like to just stop sharing your screen and I shall then start with my own presentation. Let me just get rid of that. So um, this is um, a, a, an insight, I guess, into my making and my thinking around creating this particular piece of work. Now, before I start, it's not really just about the work. Actually, it's much more about the process I went through. And much like Gary, drawing these parallels to, yes, the portfolio, but in this instance, maybe the experience uh, a student would go through to really identify kind of evaluate an entire body of work, identify what's important in that work and how that really then informs the portfolio as a process. So to give you a bit of background context to the work itself, what we're looking at is an artist book. I'm an artist book maker as well as a designer. So my own practice straddles this interesting space between art and design practice. I describe myself as a self-publisher. <clears throat> So maybe actually there are more parallels between what Tony presented initially in terms of sort of limited edition works and small published works and actually the, with Gary and the sketchbook as being something personal. So this particular art book is a, is a hybrid, I would say. It's, it's in part a catalogue, it's in part an artist book, it's a reflection space, it's also a research journal as well. So in essence, actually, the, this particular artist book contains many of the qualities we might expect to see, in particular to a progression portfolio, not just any portfolio, but particular to a progression portfolio. The narrative thread of this particular book, which I'll expand on through the next few, few slides, really weaves concerns around sort of perspectives on reflection, digestion, our sense of self, as a starting point, I joined this project um, after two years. So there was already an initial basis of several events that had generated two years worth of research around these themes. And contributors spanned so many disciplines from gastroenterology, cultural theory, fine art, art history, yoga, even, and medical humanities. Now, what we're looking at here in particular, just to talk to the slide for a second, is the opening cover. Now, a particular decision that I made around sort of the materials involved was to repurpose a Melina, a Melina, Mel, I can't speak, a medical folder. And over time, not that this was expected, but it bleaches with sun. And actually, that was something that I thought was really interesting, not part of the design process, but in itself has connotations around the body and of time and environment and conditions. And it was just an interesting series of further concepts. Just to go into then the next few slides. So on starting the publication, I was given, as you can imagine from that list of different disciplines, those contributors towards this work, such an array of different qualities of visual material, qualities of material, types of material. This involved everything from 
PowerPoint presentations to audio transcripts from photographs of events and recordings through to reproductions of artworks. There were sections of reflective text, there were short talk stories, there were technical reports, the list kind of goes on and on. Now, as you can imagine, initially facing this, I felt really quite overwhelmed by not only the vast volume of material, but also the nature and the quality of this material. And what I realised to begin with is I really needed a process involved to really sort of analyse this material, to kind of plot out the concerns within the material and how that might sort of inform how I might transform that material, or reinterpret it in some ways. For me, this involved um, not particularly environmentally friendly, perhaps, but printing out a vast range of material. And I think this might be something that Tony might talk to later as well, is about material practices and having something physical rather than relying on digital technology. Now, for me, having this huge array of printed material became a process that I would refer to as almost like plotting a constellation of concerns, really identifying the concerns within this work and how that might inform not just the reinterpretation, but perhaps the curation through the work. There were no kind of points of anchorage before I started that process. Next slide. So just as a whole series, so this is just some snapshots throughout the sort of six months period of making this. So this is from a small array of photographs, really, for out of hundreds and hundreds. And actually that in, in, in and of itself is something I would encourage around portfolio practice is this idea of regularly recording your work and doing it in quite a methodical way and thinking up front around art direction and how you effectively record your work in processes. For me, just to talk back to the project, the logistics of making for such an array of material required a material process. It was very much working with paper, digital and analog print methods, exploring modes of representation. I constantly printed materials out and brought individual sections together just to see how two particular pieces of work might have a tension or interface. Um, I could not have had that same relationship if I'd worked entirely digital. And in fact, I'm not sure it would have actually been possible. So this is really sort of the final book work itself as an artist book. Now, to come back to my analogy, what this directly informed was a process of making these connections visible through reinterpretation, intervention, curation. Now, as a methodology, the artist book has an ability to kind of mediate forms of knowledge. In this example, demonstrates how, for me, the artist book can be appropriated not as an outcome, but very similar to how Tony described it, um, or Gary described, apologies, as a tool for thinking with, or as a methodology for kind of clarifying and making sense. Now, by extension, I would argue that the progression portfolio or the portfolio has this, a similar potential. This is an aspect of my research and practice that has now gone much further in the years since. Um, this was published in 2015 and in recent projects has then sort of developed further and it's become a co-production methodology and some of my recent research really explores how the artist book can be used to work with families and children to co-design virtual reality experiences. So the artist book there is really part of the methodology, not just um, a kind of endpoint. Now, just to show you a few last kind of aspects of the work itself, just so you sort of get a sense of what this artist book is. In some respects, on inners, just looking at these pictures here demands a form of reflection. It really does demand it. It's not easy to absorb um, the nature of the material in itself, but also it requires a physical engagement. This is quite a large book in some respects, and it's quite cumbersome to hold, and the numerous sort of fold outs require different forms of engagement. What you're looking at here is the the stood upright form, so a kind of sculptural form where the main body of the work is a two metre concertina, which has an innovative binding that brings it back into a codex form. So it has that kind of mobility of travel. But then when I'm wound, 
it has this sort of ability to maybe maybe reflect a certain sense of it, the gastrointestinal tract or the nature of the body as the numerous sort of smaller concertinas, pop-ups, pamphlets unfold. They become almost like intestines around the body of the book, body of the work itself. Let me just go to my next slide. So the final curation, so the narrative throughout this book was very much based on a literal manifestation of the digestion process. So from outside of the body and through. Now there were various moments uh, where certain motifs appeared throughout the book, uh, throughout the work. So almost became kind of reoccurring themes or elements. And this was one particular character who was a, a yoga specialist and they appear at sort of discrete moments connecting with various other content with these kind of redacted transcriptions. And as a final page, um, really then talks to how the type practice and these sort of typo poetic word plays and the idea of sort of challenging different modes of reading become the coherent thread through each of the sections and each of the works. Now, this was very much my intention was to motivate kind of different forms of engagement, different forms of reading and seeing and to modulate kind of different readings around the work itself. So in essence, this is my presentation done around the actual work. But I think to conclude, perhaps the takeaway I would really highlight is perhaps reframe what the portfolio is. So don't necessarily think about the portfolio as just being an endpoint, a final result presentation, but actually the process of developing a portfolio. It's a manifestation of much bigger questions. And that maybe we'll draw out in the, the conversation after this is this really about reflecting your understanding of where you situate your practice, the concerns within the body of work. Now, albeit that is just the starting point, clearly there are then further considerations around perhaps editorial strategy, around art direction, kind of critical writing, curation, amongst many others. Um, so that's my. That's my talk. Um, let me come out of screen share. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I think it would be good to move into maybe some of the Q&A section, but I wonder before we then go into questions or before we go into questions, whether Gary, Tony, you've got any sort of thoughts, parallels that you've seen between our individual practices that you might like to share just to begin. Sorry, Tony, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, I think your point about uh, the, the portfolio being an ever-evolving state, in an ever-evolving state, is such a healthy one. And I don't think that necessarily most people view it in that way. But it's, it's just an incredibly um, important thing to understand that you're, you're, you're in an evolutionary state you know, that you, you don't come out of uh, college or even enter employment or whatever you're doing, and it remains static. It doesn't. And so it needs constant, uh, constant um, reflection, really. I think that's a, a fantastic, and that's been such an important part of my practice for sure. Absolutely. Uh, and Gary, what about, what about yourself? Is there anything maybe you would talk to? Well, yeah, I, I, you know, picking up on both of your points, um, I'm, I suppose it's the portfolio's role of both a place where you obviously engage with work that has got to some point of resolution, but also its role as a speculative tool as well. I think, you know, you, you know looking at your presentation, Tony, you know, you're, you're looking at something that isn't just about what's been there, it's also about the potential of what will come next, what a different client or a different user group would do with that sort of like, I suppose, alphabet or sort of set of sort of um, tools. And I think often with portfolios, they are too resolved and they don't allow the viewer to actually see, well, what's this artist, this practitioner going to do next? And what potentially is my role in helping them do that with somebody looking at the portfolio? 
I think that our 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 development, or my development, certainly as a as a designer and artist, has been through self initiated projects. I, I I simply wouldn't be where I am without them. Um, and I it's kind of I often quote this uh, rather dodgy film, um, The Field of Dreams, where uh, he says, "Build it, and they will come." And I realized that fairly early on that uh, if I started to make the kind of work that I wanted to make, then people would ask me to make that kind of work. And uh, that's held true for the last 20 years, you know. So it's, it's really important that you can work out where you, where you want to go, where you need to be, what your intention is, and that you can follow those intentions. Absolutely. Well, maybe, Gary, uh, Tony, this is a good point that we could perhaps go into some of the Q&A just to kind of roll on the back of you talking about self-initiated projects. Now, you've regularly in different talks, obviously talked about how self-initiated or how self-directed work is so important to spin to yourself as a practitioner. Now, I wondered if you could expand on that and in particular to maybe how that informed your your sort of sense of promotion around you as an individual, but also the studio and the identity of the studio? Well, we were, there, there was a point, I, I read um, really early on when we first started SPIN, I read um, a, put, a pamphlet that was given to me by the bank, and I'm not in the habit of reading pamphlets from banks. And uh, this said that um, uh, most businesses went out of, they went out of business after six months, then it was a year, then it was 18 months. So I set my sights on 18 months of existence. And so for 18 months, I did anything I could to survive, pretty much. And I wouldn't want to share any of that work. That wasn't, it's definitely in the draw of shame. But I survived 18 months. But after that, after that time, I made the decision that there had to be more to, to life than survival and started to make the kind of work that I wanted to make and actually resigned a few of the clients that I, that I really didn't like to work with. And we started making our self-initiated projects and they've been the, basically the, the creative impetus and commercial impetus as well for, of the studio has been... So we 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 book them in into our into our studio time. We make um, we you, you have to or else they don't happen, uh, you know. So we we book time in when like, when we're going to when we're going to work on these projects, and they're often born out of curiosity with uh, kind of different technologies or or whatever it might be. I mean, say for instance, the first one we did. The, the the notion of interactivity was just about starting out at that point. And we we made um, a kind of a little interactive piece that was picked up by Diesel Jeans. Diesel Jeans commissioned us to do a bigger interactive piece and that won lots of awards and got lots of notice. And then we did, uh, based on that, working on that, we did started working to motion graphics and the same thing happened. We did our own motion graphics piece, and that was picked up by Channel 4. We ended up doing their identity. Um, so, and with the publishing, um, I was commissioned to do a book for a commercial publisher and had a horrible experience, as I said, you know, with the, with the, the, the kind of, the, the controlling, control from every direction, and decided that wasn't what I wanted to do. So I started a publishing company, and... We started that with um, making newspapers. Instead of, instead of um, we previously we'd been kind of doing things like investing in um, awards and stuff like that, but thinking that that would get us noticed, and it did to a degree, but not really. But as soon as we started publishing for ourselves and making making um, little booklets and leaflets and newspapers about subjects that we cared about. The whole thing changed. The whole our, our whole perspective changed. So, it's it's now an integral part of my makeup and the makeup of the studio is following these creative um, impulses. 
And they always, well, pretty much nearly always find their way into commissions and projects. So, you know, they never, it's never wasted time. Really interesting, really interesting. And in some respects, I think, um, to move on to maybe a question to Gary in a moment, but I'd absolutely see a parallel there between that sort of state of initiating work and with Gary and his sketchbook and how those two are kind of in these unfixed sort of states to become sort of almost prototyping for something else. Um, so Gary, I was wondering if I could just pick up uh, very much the sketchbook within your practice. And in particular, you, you, you mention or you talk about the sort of international pedagogic kind of research projects that your sketchbooks kind of are part of or operate around. So drawing from that expertise, how would you position then the portfolio in relation to the sketchbook, but certainly from an international perspective? In a way, I think it relates quite well to what Tony was just talking about, really. And I, and I think, I think in terms of the portfolio, I think what you want to do in a portfolio is a body of work. And just as the practice that Tony you've just done, you know, you, you don't. It's, you know, practice is not animal. You don't do one project at a time. They're all happening at the same time. They're all feeding one another. And I think in terms of that sense of the projects that I'm involved with, you know, I'm, well, recently I've been working with university and colleges in China and then I'm working in the UK with other providers, other educational platforms, and they're happening at the same time. So one day you're dealing with one project and it's very sort of focused on a particular age group or a particular type of learning. And the next day, so they're quite different, but there's always a connection. And I, and I feel sometimes when I look at portfolios, it really feels like, well, I've done that project, now I'll do the next one, now I'll do the next one. And I feel actually you're looking at a portfolio from five different people in one because it's almost the hats have been removed. And I don't think you can ever remove that hat as a practitioner because you're bringing with you every moment of your creative endeavor sort of into weeds. And you do, you have to compartmentalize it in terms of certain sort of um, audiences or certain projects, but that ability to switch. And if you can see that in the portfolio, you know that's something that is really genuine for that person. And clearly, you can see their identity. I'm too I'm not sure about the geese in the background. I assure you, I don't have any geese in the background, but I seem to be reverberating. Um, it's probably all of those projects happening at once. Um, so, but I do think that's key. And in terms of the sketchbook, finally, I would say that use not just for me, it's a sketchbook, but just the way you, you'll have things all over. Bring them together and see how they interlink. When you look at the portfolio, you want to see where the person may be going next, not just the places they've been. And it can happen really quite effortlessly if you just actually make those connections and don't try to fit the projects into very sort of prescribed, um, well, frameworks and see the portfolio as a living, breathing entity and fundamentally something that you can do once you press the application button. Your portfolio is something that's with you for the rest of your life, just as the sketchbook for me is something that's been in my practice for the last 30 years. And it's something that you had to reinvent, revisit on a constant level. And as somebody who sees a lot of portfolios, it's something I'm always looking for within a portfolio is this sense that the person really is in really curiously engaged with every aspect of their practice and not just saying, here's the beginning, here's the middle, here's the end, on to the next project, but actually taking that practice through to each endeavour, each engagement. Absolutely. And I think it's... Um... 
it's very true to say to sort of follow that on that this idea of maybe a template around the portfolio is a kind of misnomer to that that it kind of homogenizes um, many aspects of creative practice and I think if we was to look at in the way that we're talking about the portfolio here the portfolio as a practice is inherently multidisciplinary so therefore it is touching the languages the methods the processes of different disciplines and I think that needs to come through but as you say the maybe the idea of authentic voices that that is an absolutely critical ingredient maybe to what is a, a good a good portfolio absolutely and that that gives me the opportunity to ask you a question then really at that point um i think as somebody whose practice is very much around this notion of the position of the author this sense of you know sort of um, not only in terms of leading the narrative but also sort of like complete ownership of the process how would you position your practice within the notion of a portfolio and this notion of publishing. Absolutely. Um, well, I think if we was to step back and consider maybe for a moment historic precedents around the actual portfolio or sort of links between the artist book, the artist and the portfolio as having these moments of crossover or, or, or where one and the same example might exist. Now, for me as an artist book maker and an authorial designer, I think there is an interesting and quite fine line between the presentation of a body of work and when the presentation becomes the work. And I think there's a really interesting idea that might differentiate perhaps an artist book in some instances from um, a monograph in others. And I think that idea of the author or the authorial role of the designer. However, I wouldn't say that's a fixed line. It's a, it's a kind of an unfixed line, an indeterminate space between the two. And I think that also reflects maybe the voice of the author itself or the voice of the practitioner. Now, I think if we was to look at maybe 20th century sort of example, the lever to lever de artiste, for instance, is an absolute sort of moment where we can look at it as a type of portfolio or a parallel to a portfolio. The idea that this was very much taken advantage of kind of the growth of visual art through the 19th century and that editors saw this as an opportunity to market deluxe sort of limited editions. Now, even that in itself, you know, it's perhaps the role of the image within the lever de artiste that there's a sort of hierarchy change that has happened. The images were no, are not in a sort of secondary position to just illustrate the text. They, they are very much sort of primary um, to that sort of role between text and image. Now, these images were also individual. Um, and kind of original works of art created by those artists and were often sort of produced in limited editions. Now, this might have meant they could access, say, for instance, printmaking. So the idea of sort of woodcuts or, or, or lithographs or etchings, for instance. Now, there's another aspect to this, which um, is really about the statue of those particular artists involved in the lever, the artist, that essentially there is a particular book work produced by almost every major early 20th century artist. And I think that is a sort of real key point. Now, maybe one could also argue perhaps against sort of points why it's not a portfolio and maybe the role of the editor or perhaps the collaborator between writer and artist. And therein lies perhaps aspects why it's perhaps not a portfolio. Um, I think as one particular historic precedent that I would draw attention to, and there's a, a quote I would like to read, is De, per De Pero's Futurista as being argued as the, the world's first portfolio. Um, so 1927 by Italian futurist De Pero, informally called the bolted book, is this idea of a mobile music museum, sort of a work contained and a curated selection of an entire body of work, which, you know, included painting, sculpture, architecture, fashion, graphic design, interior design, product set design, costumes, and many other things. Now, to go to this quote, and I think this really sort of sets the tone to maybe a sort of um, a contemporary lens on the portfolio. Um, so just to read verbatim, 
It is time to be done with the recognition of the artist after his death or in advanced old age. The artist needs to be recognised, appreciated and glorified in his time. And to this end, he's entitled to use all the most effective and unheard of means for advertising their own genius and their own works. Now, I think that's a, a sort of really interesting way to then think about sort of contemporary notions around what is a portfolio. Um, you know, the idea of effective might be in some ways not only what you say, but how you say it. And certainly unheard of means, well, that might not actually be about emerging technologies today, but actually might be much more about disrupting norms and conventions in some way around self-promotion, around what is the portfolio. Um, now, I think this sort of thing is in a backdrop against a, obviously a much bigger question here about how does a practitioner market to themselves and what is a portfolio? Is it one entity? We've sort of talked about parallels between the portfolio and publishing, sort of notions of maybe the self-authored work such as artist books, or we haven't spoken about zine culture, but I think zine culture has its own place within this. And then maybe typically trade or small published work. So things like monographs, exhibition catalogues is an interesting parallel. However, and, and in some ways, you know, or for all of these print sort of versions, there is a digital equivalent and a plethora of those. And then, of course, there are all sorts of other forms. So, Tony, you showed a showreel to begin with, the role of the website, about networking and maybe creative platforms, What's the value of social media? And I think that's kind of a big question, but what is the value of social media in relation to the portfolio about Instagram or having you know, a professional Facebook page? Or what's the worth of LinkedIn? Is this about maybe identifying different communities of practice or different audiences for your work perhaps? And then what about those other kind of emerging vehicles, sort of virtual spaces, virtual galleries, custom made platforms, live recordings or audio recordings, are these all essentially in the form of a kind of portfolio? Now, I think in a way what we're alluding to is maybe that in reality, we're talking about a progression portfolio or a portfolio as a discrete kind of thing with its own set of requirements. Actually, there's a sort of much bigger question here around sort of the portfolio and pre professional practice. And Tony, you sort of alluded to that really, that there's a need to sort of strategically consider all or multiple platforms, multiple forms of communication and what their purpose is. Um, that's kind of my thoughts really around sort of practice and my practice in particular, the artist book uh, and, and, and the portfolio. Um, I was wondering, would either of you have any sort of thoughts around sort of wrapping up some, some of those points in our, in our sort of talking points there? Well, okay, fair um, the, for, for us, there was, um, it's interesting the social media type side of things, the Instagram side of things, because it, when, when we first got engaged with that, we had no idea really what we were doing or why we were doing it particularly. Um, it just seemed like um, uh, a place where we could put, we, where we could share with anyone that was interested um, sketches and notions, things that weren't necessarily complete that, we, that we'd enjoyed making or that we thought were successful in some way. And it has sort of blossomed into something uh, to a really quite important communications communication for us. I mean, if it, we, we never in a million years would I have thought that we would that clients would come to us through Instagram, but more and more they're coming through Instagram, and they're seeing what what they're seeing are some complete work, but. There's an awful lot of sketchy work. There's an awful lot of stuff that's that's work in progress or hasn't been quite fulfilled. And it seems to be that 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 connects in some way. That people find that exciting. That 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 notion that something is has, isn't final and isn't complete, and uh, that they're seeing in some way the background. And I think we're kind of living in the age of sharing now. Um, you know where. It's, it's only a good thing if you share your process and what, the things that you're making. 
whether they've been fully realized and are completely shiny and polished and complete, you know, finished or not. Um, there, there seems to be a lot of interest in that. I mean, the first, the biggest amount of likes we ever got for one of our Instagrams posts so far was a picture of our, our wall. Because whenever we're doing, we're working, we, we cover a wall in sketches. And I, and I couldn't think of what to put up. So I just took a picture of this, the wall um, and it showed uh, various iterations of things and ideas and development. And that, that by far was the most popular thing that we posted, you know, much more than the finished material. Absolutely. Um, I, I'm just wary of time here. We're into, uh, sadly, the last few moments or minutes of, of today's conversation. So I thought this would be a good time to maybe bring some of our audience attendees into the conversation. If you have any of your own thoughts you'd like to share or perhaps challenges around experiences you've had with your portfolio. So, um, Joe, I believe you're going to share some questions. Yes, thank you, Richard. So the most voted question is from Miles Skinner. Uh, with a possible saturation of graphic designers and artists, Instagram accounts and websites, what advice would you give to get your work seen by the people you want to see it, aside from cold emailing or just turning up at their local pub after stalking them? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Tony, would you like to take that question or should I take that question? Well, um... <laughs> I would say that the best thing that you can do is to any if I if I ever receive a PDF or or a, a link on my in my inbox, I'm going to look at it. And if you think about it, if you send it, if you send if you've got a nice website or you've got a nice a nice um, PDF that you can share, and it's going to be on a beautiful high resolution screen, because I'm thinking about my, I was dragging around this horrible, massive black portfolio, um, these art care portfolios, it was hideous. And, um, you know, now you can land, land on the, in the front of any individual pretty much. And the same with, it's, it's the same through Instagram, if you contact someone through Instagram, it's very difficult not to look at that person's feed. So, You've got immediate kind of connections there, um, but how to, I, I, it depends really what your intention is. What do you want to get out of this, you know, interaction with someone else? What, what are you contacting them for? Um, you know, because you've got to be clear about, like I get so many um, emails and solicitations for various things that have no idea who we are and no idea of what we've done. They're just completely irrelevant. They're a complete waste of time. So I would say be careful about who you contact and contact them with a purpose. But that's, that's, you can contact pretty much anybody in that way. And if your work is good and relevant and they can see the connection, then you're halfway there, really. Absolutely. Maybe I could just follow on with some with some extra thoughts as, as well, just very briefly. Um, in some respects, I think this also comes back to this idea of strategically understanding the platforms you're using, um, not to just duplicate across platforms. Each of these offer something different and something new and a new way of seeing your work. So part of that strategy. So Tony talked to maybe Instagram becomes the kind of notional behind the scenes, whereas you're getting a different form of experience maybe through the website or other forms of engagement. And I think it is about strategically, yes, but also disrupting some of those norms. Now, for me, a key key ingredient of maybe something that might stand out is, is certainly the idea of the, the personality of the practitioner. I think there is something around seeing the authentic voice of the practitioner and really sort of getting a sense of who they are, what their interests are, are really, really important. So that sort of level, which quite often gets edited out of the final portfolio where you see just the face of the practice or just the face of technically um, technically good photography. You don't really get to see the sense of who maybe sits behind that. Um, I won't talk for too long because I think we've, we've probably got some other questions, Joe. 
Uh, yes, the next question is uh, from Paul Murdoch. How important do you think it is to represent sketchbook work and your own design process in a portfolio rather than just showing the end product? Over to Gary, perhaps you would like to say that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's a really relevant question, thank you. I mean, um, essential, um, fundamentally. Um, even if your development process doesn't use a sketchbook, you, you have to show us the journey. And also as well, I think the other important thing as well, show us the failures, show us the moments where you've decided to, you know, close down that route of research, either permanently or for a moment. And because that will inform where this sort of and, and this final work, I'm almost sort of reticent to even use the term. I think it should be about a point of resolution. All things, a, a page in a sketchbook is resolved. It may lead to the next page. It may lead to an exhibition, an installation. It might lead to a series of works in a completely different media. But without <clears throat> those little sort of moments, those, those sort of insights into practice, um, it's impossible to really understand where this is coming from and I think also it's your conversation with the work not just presenting the work because you're applying fundamentally at MA level to engage with research and to engage with the research community so in that sense you need to show that that portal of conversation is open and is live. And that's where the supporting work is so essential. Absolutely. Um, we, we are sadly almost up to time. Uh, uh, Joe, do you think we maybe have time for one brief question to conclude? I think, yes, we can go uh, one more if, um, if the audience uh, would like to stay for a couple more minutes. Uh, the next question is from Rebecca Hall. Uh, what if your portfolio artist book has to be digital and viewed alongside many others in a job application process? Uh, how would you recommend making something that stands out but matches the job description or job role? Um, well, perhaps I will take on that question then since it's aligned to artist books. Um, I, I, in some respects, you've already outlined many of the considerations that I would almost put back to you. So the fact that you're understanding the context, the purpose of this portfolio, who's seeing this portfolio, all begins to have a way in which you might shape and frame the presentation on one hand, but also the kind of critical discourse around the work itself. I do think it comes back to some really sort of clear pointers around Gary spoke to the importance of process. And I think that's really important that those factors are there, that someone gets to understand your methods, maybe the technologies that are important to you. Um, but to be also, the key here is to be assertive and decisive in that kind of critical commentary, have a strong narrative, have a strong editorial voice around the work. And I think it's, it's then, you know, this idea of sort of stand out, something is going to stand out because it's maybe got a coherence around it rather than it is necessarily shouting. I do think considering the kind of visual language of the work, the sort of identity that you might use, even notionally the cover of your portfolio has an important role. Um, so those are maybe just some very quick pieces of feedback. So um, I believe, sadly, we have reached the end of our time and our conversation. Um, it's been an honour to have chaired this session. Um, I'd like to send my gratitude to, to you, Tony. So thank you on behalf of the USCA. Um, your insight has been, you know, has really added a different perspective in this conversation. It's really appreciated for your time today, and I'm sure the attendees gained a lot from you. And likewise, Gary, thank you. Thank you for obviously sharing your work. Um, so that's very much it for now um, from us. So thank you very much.